I'm delighted to see so many people here. Fantastic. We've picked up one of those subjects which I think, above all at the convention and at the trade fair, are a big topic, and that is over-tourism. We wanted to see if there is such a thing as over-tourism, uh, visitor flows, not only in the hotspots, but what about in other places, small places, small towns, rural areas? Do these problems happen there? Do we have conflicts, perhaps, between tourism and other people so that tourism is restricted? I can't answer the question on my own, so I have some fantastic guests here who are going to help me. We have our expert from Fraunhofer, who's taken a big look. That's Gerald Svarat. He's head of the Liaison Office and Project Coordinator for Smart Rural Areas. We're looking at other areas, too. It's not just about tourism, after all. It's not just about managing visitors. It's also about trade and urban development or rural development. He's going to help us on that. Then we have Mr. Kneisel from the Startup Association here in Germany. He has his own company as well, and I'm sure he can tell us a little bit about this as well. You are a co-organizer of this panel. And then from the practical side here in Germany, Gerd Lenski announced him yesterday. We were quite proud of this, and here he is, joined us today from the Black Forest, Thorsten Rudolf from his company, Hochschwarzwald Tourismus. They actually confront the problem. So you will sit down. Let's start with Gerald. Gerald Svarat. As I said, you at the Frauenhofer have been looking at smart rural areas, smart cities. What experience do you have with this issue? And where do you think there's a crossover maybe with tourism? Or where, we, where do we need to be careful that we don't suffer from disconnect? Yes, it's quite amazing that we've talked a great deal about smart cities. That's a real buzzword in digitalization and has been for some years now. Things have changed. But basically, if we're talking about sustainable and environmental holistic strategies for development, what else is there? In Germany, this tends not to happen. It happens to be the companies like the port in Hamburg, where they're concerned about efficiency and they're driving these kind of processes. Or here in Berlin, there are research institutes that are developing big new centers, but hubs, but nothing much is happening. There haven't been many attempts to say what's happening in cities and what strategy can we develop together. That would make the most sense, but it hardly happens in Germany. If it does, then through funded projects. But what is the link with tourism and, above all, the impact of too much tourism? We're not seeing that at all in Germany, even though citizens have raised these issues and it has to be part of any strategy to talk about tourism too. But the two sides aren't coming together. And if we see that the fuss they've had in Barcelona with Airbnb and private renting, you see they can't handle it. They're talking about introducing arrow systems and we need to renew the management. In Amsterdam, they're doing that already. They've got I Amsterdam, for example, in an attempt to manage the flows. They have this city map. And first thing people tend to do when they come into a city in their bus is they go to a museum, and then they take a boat trip in the afternoon. So the idea is you look at the map, you look where the green areas are, and you maybe turn that program around. Look to see where the other people are all clustering at the moment. Or look and see, what about the beaches? Oh, there's one 18 kilometers away since they called it City Strand, City Beach. Everyone's been going out there because it's on the map. They can see it. So you need the products. You need the intelligence. There are solutions, but in Germany, we don't have that connection between the smart city and the tourism and the data evaluation. And that is what we've been looking at. So you do have some projects in rural areas that you've been working with. I think Smart Country was one. What's happening there? What kind of things are you doing? And can we learn from that? Can we learn from other places for rural areas? Yes, unfortunately, there have been a lot of projects, but usually they are in silos. They don't talk to each other. And they're on specific themes like e-government. They don't normally get joined up. In Baden-Württemberg, 
there are data platforms being developed, and it's really important now that the towns keep control of that because the trust is there and you get the operational excellence for the cities, for the towns. And they need that, of course. If you give people the data, it seems that 22% of millennials would be quite happy to give their data to the providers, but that's not necessarily a good idea. So if you collect the data, how can you use it for management in different destinations? Data platform, I think, is going to be the cue to introduce Bastian Kneisel. I think that's the kind of thing you work with, isn't it, your business model? Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about where you come from and what you are doing in your company and your association. And is it OK if the towns keep sovereignty over the data? Yes, I represent the German Startup Association here. So we work on the platform Travel Tech, all the German startups that are working on this kind of theme. I've got my own startup as well, where we do that kind of thing. We've been working with destinations, with hotels, ski resorts. And we see there are lots of different systems generating data, but basically they're not networked. That's the problem. And the potential that we have with the data needs to be tapped. So if I speak on behalf of the Startup Association, I would like to highlight the fact that we recognize a problem. There are lots of big companies and consultants that are running around using the big buzzwords, but forgetting to do their homework, the basics. And what we're trying to work out is a kind of roadmap. What do we need to start doing so that if we are worried about over-tourism, what can we do to evaluate the data I need? You've been talking about this in the Black Forest. And that's the problem we all have at the moment, because we don't have the expertise. We don't need blockchain. We need interface functionality for systems. And that's what Monglitics is doing. We are docking onto that problem. But we often have the problem that we have these very different systems. Some are on premises down in the basement, but there aren't any real interfaces. And that's the issue we're looking at at the moment. So, OK, let's move on. You are the practitioner. You are trying to tap into that siloed data and do something with it. What are you doing with it? And do you have any problems with that in the Black Forest? I think. We have to look forward two or three years. And there's a nice example I like to quote. You've got a young couple breakfasting in Hamburg, talking and saying, it's time we took a holiday. And what we can see in the first studies now, in the first stage, is that you've got Alexa <coughs> Home or Google Home. And it's so intelligent now that it recognizes that they're planning a holiday and answers, OK, I've just been checking your diaries. And from the 15th to the 22nd of July, you've got time to take a little holiday. So they both say, great. And then we know, or the system knows, because of the music they like and what they order from Amazon and what their profiles are, they will get a suggestion from that device, from that system, for a holiday. I say, why don't you go over there? It might even book it for them. So the couple goes off, and they get to their hotel. They've got the technical installations like Google Home they want, and they can carry on with their Google Chats. But then the question is, what is the task of the destination in all this system? That is really an important question. We need to get away from being a destination marketing company. We heard about this yesterday from a management company here. I'd just like to add, what if you have a brand as a destination? You have to do your management. You have to do your branding as a destination. And eight years ago, we started doing that with the Black Forest map. And we've got several hundred thousand a year, 650,000 guests, and about half of them are using it. All kinds of companies are involved. It's a kind of chip where we can recognize where the guest comes from, what hotel they're in, what they're interested in, what sites they've been visiting. And that gives us an idea. We can start to time it then. 
we can say, okay, they've checked in, where will they go as a family? And we've got a lot of data pools which we have to cluster, combine, so that we can visualize that customer journey plotted. It is already possible so that when they place their booking with the hotel, we can invite those guests, offer them more details about the hotel, where it is, what's available around there, start filling in some of the requests, and the hotel can start preparing it so that when they arrive, the guest can have studied the destination a little bit, and then we can have started to set things up for them, which means we can also manage the flows. For example, if they want to go swimming, and there's a big thermal bath there, and they have tens of thousands of guests, we know when the peak times are, and in the future we'll be able to send a text to the guest and say it's not a good time to go, we suggest you come in two or three hours so that you don't have to queue. And we can recommend that they do that. So we don't say, no, you can't go, because that wouldn't be good news at all. We can recommend that they go a bit later. And the providers are playing the game, are they? Because that's not always so easy to get everyone around the table, is it? Uh, very often you've got the top-ranked companies. Maybe in your kind of area it's easier to control people with an app. When you've got lots of different companies and you start recommending, don't you quickly have conflicts of interest? Which brings me back to destination management, because we have this map with over 100 services that can be used free every day. So we can influence the guest. We're not dependent on where the guest goes. We can tra try actively to influence the guest. We can contact the guest. We've got the product available. and. We can draw on those 100 different services. And of course, the service providers have an interest in that. They don't particularly want to queue outside their door of people who are getting cross because they're having to wait. They'd much rather it that people are making the most of their day, and they don't all turn up at 12 o'clock. Some turn up at 2 or 3 in the afternoon or even in the evening. And the providers are actually quite grateful that we can spread things this way. So how do you assess this? What competence do you need? What skills? Because we're in Germany here, there's a lot of tourism, but let's take an international view of this. I don't really know the situation. Do we have the skills? Our vocational training systems, our continuous training systems, or do we need new people to come in here from the technical field and do this for us? Because sometimes I get the feeling that there are some systems that have been introduced in tourism with artificial intelligence and so forth. But the people who implement these systems tend to come from the technical field. I know when we had that startup competition a few years ago, and we had that artificial intelligence app and recommendation system like you describe, uh, based on the profile that they know I have with Facebook and so forth, these apps will put a trip together for me. So do we need new skills in the sector? We certainly do. We have to think in an overlapping sort of way. We've got a clever system because we've got these universities providing excellent theoretical essentials, but more and more people have to learn as practitioners new skills. We have eight or nine students that we train on the job, and we don't get them in to have a cup of coffee with us. We actually get them in to come in and learn how we work, and after they've finished their course after about three years, they should be ready to enter mid-management. And on the technical side, we've got an online manager that we've just hired who came from an agency in Hamburg. He moved down from Hamburg to the Black Forest because he said, I like what you're doing. I think I can contribute. So we really have some skills that we've brought in. The quality that they have is quite unusual, actually. I wanted to comment on that. At the research ministry, we have this project, Future of Work, and that's dominated by us losing our jobs to robots and it getting worse and worse. But this is an area where we're talking about new potential. At the moment, we're talking about data scientists, a new occupation. And we have to design university courses and think about how to network with other disciplines and how we can help you. And if we think about that, it's a very practically oriented new specialization that people can study and do useful things with. So we're talking about a new vocation here, a new employment profile. 
I'd like to be a bit more practical on that front. With our startups, we always try to address specific problems. And in tourism, we think, well, what is the product of tourism? It's the experience. It's not a material object that I can buy over the counter. And experience always has something to do with service. What we're seeing at the moment is there are very different players who are moving into this area, like Booking.com, Airbnb, and so forth. Now, if we think about the value chain and where that value chain begins, well, it starts in the Black Forest with your small providers, those little hotels that generate those experiences. So really, put your hand on your heart. And what about the data now? If people book, most people will go through Booking.com. You have your own booking engine, but a lot of the data is with Booking.com and co. So now, if I'm worried about over-tourism and I compare that with experience, then we're seeing an increasing gap, an increasing imbalance. You formulated that so well. You said, what is our role as a destination in the future? And I think it's good that you address that problem because that is the critical factor. The hotels, of course, say, well, why would I need that if they can't satisfy people, if they send people to swimming pools that are over full, why would we work with them? So we need that expertise, and there's far too little of it. People need to be trained. People need to study these things, as you say, who understand digitalization in universities. They need to learn this. Then they need to go out there into the destinations to develop an understanding and work out how things can be networked. And I think that's one of the most critical points. But then, you need the, you've still got the problem that the platform data isn't held by the government. It's in the hands of the international companies. Exactly. So if there is cooperation, if I have a data management platform, the destination builds that platform, and then we integrate that, and the hotels are so well networked that I have the tap points where that relation can unfold. Because we're talking about a value chain, aren't we? The whole experience is based on relationships, and that's basically just relationship management. And I have to do that at all the touch points so that a guest notices and wants this communication. For example, how do I digitalize tourist information? That's the kind of thing that we're identifying to work on. And we have a lot of solutions in the association that are working towards that. For example, we have an app that you can use in the hotel, or you have that application as well. And all of these things have to be networked. Exactly networking, that's the point, isn't it? I see the tourism apps that offer special information. I'm thinking that's what we focus on. We've just had that study that came out, for example, huge problem with traffic. How do we manage traffic flows? Are there solutions there from smart cities that we can draw on? And can we network that with these tourism issues? Because I think that would be one of the things that a lot of people are feeling affected by now, especially when guests arrive at their hotel and they start looking for somewhere to park around the hotel and they arrive quite flustered. Are there any ways of helping them there? Is anyone working on that? Yes, there are all kinds of things. Telecom is trying to do this in Hamburg. So all these big companies are trying to introduce their pilot projects in the big studies. So of course, they want everyone to use a telecom solution or a Cisco solution. So they are all working on their silos. But of course, what we want is mobility service. We want car sharing which can also be used in the rural areas. But that means, of course, we need to invest money. And we need an open platform with common standards and open interfaces. And when you've got that, then different services from different providers, the kind of thing that you want as a, as a district, as a rural area, or a small town, you can get other people on board, including your data experts. But mobility is a core problem. And in Berlin, the Kelly family, for example, recently performed. And all the concerts were full. Fantastic location where people could use the local rail system. But what did they do? They introduced a shuttle service with buses, one small minibus. Now, so the question is, it makes sense to do that at 10 p.m. on an ordinary evening, but not when there's a big concert going on. So obviously, people have to wait longer. Networking is really important, I think. The question is, who 
can play a role here the way you see it? Who should be taking part in this networking? Should it be the tourist experts who approach the local authorities and say, we need these solutions, but your local residents can use these too? What happens if a local resident arrives in town and they can't park either to do their shopping? I mean, who is going to play the driving role here? I think as a management company, yes, we have a bigger and bigger role to play. I think we have more and more tasks in infrastructure. We've been talking about what to do there. For example, if we take responsibility for the public toilets, we've got this with TTC. Hundreds of coaches arrive. How do you manage them? They all rush into the toilets in the big hotel. There isn't really a welcoming culture. We have to generate this welcome culture so that when these flows come in, we have to work on that together with the towns, with the town councils, and come up with proposals. So we said, OK, we'll take on responsibility for the toilets, we'll build them, we'll manage them, we'll take the money, but we want to create an experience so that when people come in, the first thing they say is, wow, what a fantastic toilet. And that's their first impression. Because when you arrive anywhere as a tourist, you, you want to park and you want a toilet, and then you're happy, you're relaxed, and then you can start enjoying your holidays. And, but all the local authorities say, oh, we can't afford these things, we can't afford the toilets. So we need smart solutions for pooling our efforts in the infrastructure. And the DMO, a smart DMO, is called upon here not only to draw up marketing plans, but to take responsibility along with the local councils and the regions to work on this infrastructure to start planning the traffic flows. And something else we do is to work with hospitality, with the restaurants and with the holiday apartments. We've got pilot projects. We've been running some of our own, what we call cuckoo's nests, our own holiday apartments. So we do more managing ourselves as a DMO and try to network with others. So what's your relationship with the mayor, for example? How do you network? with the politicians in the rural areas. Is it positive? Is it happening fast enough for you? Fortunately, it's happening very fast. We have a very close relationship with our mayor. And every quarter, we uh, agree on things. Sometimes we do it on a bilateral basis only. So it's very clear. We don't have to think uh, of, you know, up in an ivory tower. That's what we're doing anyway. We have to think and act regionally. I mean, if you've got a, a spa paradise, which has 750,000 visitors, which is right up there in the Champions League, wouldn't have happened if we hadn't got all the parishes together and said, right, we work together. We put everything together. We don't think in, in little uh, isolated places. We, we uh, have a proper investor. It started with 30 million, now we've got 50, 60 million more. I mean, we soon have 100 million. I think this is a pretty rare thing. My experience tells me that sort of thing is virtually impossible to find. Well, you've got a region which is very much characterized by tourism and, and has been so for many years, but it's not always working the way it is uh, where it is with you. But you've got experience too with the two country projects going to the Black Forest area. How is it if you try to get people on board on, on the, in the local communities? It may be attractive for the communities to make the whole region attractive uh, for tourists as well as, by the way, for the inhabitants. But what's your experience in trying to, to do that? How can you approach people to be enthusiastic? Well, I can say I think that lots of people moving around to Germany would be very happy if people like you uh, would tell us these stories, this commitment and, and, you know, all these workshops. We're always talking about how can we do something together, develop ideas um, to be successful on, on the, at the local level. But there are all these sort of nationwide, Eurowide tenders where, you know, regional local authorities, people are asked, what would be the ideas you would like to, to implement tourism issues? Uh, think holistic, think cross everything. But it's pretty rare that there are any sort of companies involved, certainly not in tourism. So it's wonderful to hear this particular story because that's not what gets down to us at the local level. And if we're looking for concepts like this in Baden Württemberg, for example, there are lots of people who want to collect data, and we have to think, how can companies help? But the only companies interested are the retailers or the water utility, if you like, and nobody else comes and says, hey, I'd like to have a stake in this. So developing ideas together, that's what, what you talked about, is, is what is lacking. We need to carry that across to us. I mean, we can learn from you instead of reinventing the wheel. I, I, I know there are problems too, and, and uh, you got it from somewhere else, but that's what Google is all about. You can adapt what's good. Innovation doesn't always have to be entirely new. 
but apply something which is good and, and do it in your way. I think we also have to make sure that when the um, data protection directive uh, really comes now, it, it will also be a factor. But I think the whole thing gives us an opportunity to rethink matters because we can't just say, like, we say cookies, tick that box, that spot, tick. But we, we have to do much more. We have to look more closely and get the, the guests to actually follow uh, the destination and also go the digital route. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. We have to prove that we've got, you know, the, the free design consent and so on. We're getting more into this desirability thing, like in, in branding. A destination hasn't just to be well known, but it has to be desirable. We have to make things desirable that the guest wants. In other words, I need to have an app which is a bit more than a travel guide. I need one that can direct people from A to B and that provide recommendations, not this nasty push, push, which you get fed up with, but the guest has to want to download the app and then use it. That's where we have to go to. And then if we do that properly, we don't have a problem with privacy either. It would give us a great opportunity to use that uh, and and make it positive and and put it in, in such a way that it can serve the whole structure. That will be the next thing going into the legal uh, framework and, and the, the various regulations that exist, aren't they proving a bit of an obstacle? for many to, to get active. Now, you've, you've already talked about this a bit prematurely, but don't worry. Um, have you already implemented uh, this um, data protection thing? Are there problems with personal data? How, how can you solve that? Seems to be a bit of a specter at the moment. Can, can we deal with that? It isn't a problem at all. We call it privacy by default because you can set up the system and systems in such a way that they do comply with the relevant laws. You can make various data anonymous, and you can still have uh, customized um, offers for certain target groups and individuals. You can do all sorts of things. We're working with lawyers, and they're some of the best that, that exist in that market. They've been looking into privacy and data protection issues for years, and there are all sorts of different uh, ways in which we can do special data protection agreements uh, where we can get uh, prior informed consent from people and can still be transparent vis-a-vis -vis the guests. I think uh, the whole thing is a great opportunity because it allows you to set yourself up in a completely new way. That's not where the thing is, is a problem. I've got another problem. What's your problem then? As a startup, we've decided to concentrate on hotels primarily because it, it proved impossible in the destination environment to get our product into the market. We couldn't launch. Reason being, we're working with a destination. The destination uses a, a guest card. The one, the destination we work with has it organized by the regional authority. So suddenly, we're no longer just response, uh, uh, dependent on, on that destination by the technology that the regional government is putting to finance. Then there's another agency, and that manages the guest card. And they said, well, right, if you want to uh, put that in in smart ways, we've done that. We've been able to do all sorts of maps where we could um, have sort of direction for, for visitors, route uh, navigation, and so on. But there were a few things that we couldn't do, like personal registration registration on this map so that people can communicate. So we said, right, this needs to be implemented. And they said, right, uh, we need funding from the regional government. The regional government said, no, we won't. Oh, and in between, let's not forget the mayor is involved as well with his or her own agenda. And that's why things uh, fail. You try somehow to get that deal. I mean, you think you've, you've got it all sewn up. And that was not easy. But then you don't get all the parties involved together. And then you've got wonderful potential lying fallow. And you're asking, so why should we invest 10,000 euros to make that uh, map for the guests smarter? And you see that everywhere, whether in Germany or in Austria. This type of parochial thinking is, is something which happens everywhere. We're not saying we try to play it um, differently, be in it for the long haul, but develop a strategy which will be going across different regional organizations. That's why, why, I start, why in our startup organization, we're doing everything we can so as to attract the political side as well and develop really detailed concept that would allow us to go into destinations but on a uh, from a much higher level so you you still need a lot of political backup in order to make progress it's not just you, you need skills that's one um, issue you need to have the skills to actually implement these things probably more than we have uh, had in the past all this data management issue there are often sort of lacks of competence. There's a bit of a deficit in, in, in the knowledge. Um, but uh, even if we had all that, it still wouldn't work, right? It's probably the same with many of the smart uh, projects we have. There was another conflict which I can't imagine would happen 
uh, which we got from the social media. I mean, do guests want to be directed from A to B? I mean, the guest has this lovely video, wanted to do this and that, sort of non-friction. Amazon to go in the destination, destination to go, if you like. But I've got my, I don't know, uh, bracelet or, or little card and, and can use that to, to enter whatever facility, go shopping, get loyalty points. Do guests really want that? Or do they say, I want to go where I want to go, not where I am sent? It's absolutely right. I don't want to be completely directed and nobody is to tell me what to do, but that's not what it's all about. I think the word recommendation here is very important. I'm always grateful for information. Let's stay with some of the examples we had earlier. Let's say I know I'm, I'm stuck in a traffic jam for half an hour and then have to queue. Well, um, I'd be grateful for getting the information. I don't have to go there now. I can, you know, maybe I can get in at, at four o'clock so I do something else for two hours. I think this is what I mean by, by directing people. I don't mean forcing them to do some, something. We're far removed from that, actually. Uh, with our recommendation, we work on a, on a sort of voluntary basis. We, we can, you know, people can accept this voluntary direction. They're happy. They know. Um, th that they liked it because it's a service. It's, it's like the travel recommendations. They say, I guess, please tell us when you're arriving so that we can tell you there's a construction site. Don't use this road, but the other one. Otherwise, you'll be stuck in traffic for half an hour. And the guests arrive and say, oh, God, I'm so happy. Wonderful you sent me that news because otherwise I would have been stuck in traffic for half an hour. And that is something which guests actually appreciate. So making the advantages clear. I'd like to use um, this opportunity to ask the audience whether you have any questions to some of our participants here in the podium. Any question to a panelist? We've got roving mics. Would anybody like to ask a question? Off the cuff or? Yes, I see somebody at the, at the back. Um, please briefly introduce yourselves or, you know, what you're particularly interested in. Is, is that would be lovely. I am Stephanie Fessel. I'm from Erfurt. And I would like to know how you mm, look at the possibilities of funding for communication and all these projects. Um, do you think uh, it's a destination, the tourism companies? What about the funding? You mean where the money comes from? The, the question is continuing off mic. Your interpreter can't hear the question. I will give you the answer when it comes. Answer. It's very important that normally, um, as somebody working in tourism, you have, you know, as a destination, for example, or a DMO, you have a budget that normally the, the local authorities make available to you. And your job is to use that money in the most intelligent way. That's what I always say. If you just work on this very isolated basis, you have a certain limited amount and, and you're very restricted now, you spend that. Now imagine you take that times 10 or 20 or 50, then you have a lot more money available and you can use synergy effects. Doing the same work will actually cost you less. You can combine staff and they can be much more focused and do more. It gives you new ways of creating other jobs, which we've done because suddenly we did online management and lots of things that you know, and one little organization can't do. And if you then uh, set up projects which are set up according to our philosophy, where we say that we want to actually end up making money with the events and the experience and whatever we do, that's quite important. Because if we do that, we have money left over which we can reinvest. And then you can convince partners, external partners, to invest in your projects. We um, convinced a building company, for example, to do an apartment project with us uh, where we got a 50 percent partner providing quite some liquidity for that company so that we have money for investment again. So it's a management issue. Management uh, also means um, financial management and how to, to do your contracts properly and so on. And then hopefully they, there's enough left at the end of the day for you to reinvest. I would like to ask a follow-up question to you. As far as hotels are concerned, they're now investing most of their money in Booking.com in order to reach their target group and get their bookings. And then there is no money left to invest in such systems as we were talking about. I think that's fascinating because we've been discussing it yesterday. It's absolutely amazing if you consider how many thousands of euros these Booking.com, Expedia and, and similar organizations get. I don't know what you get, do in order to get the reach you have. 
Now, basically, they invest their money in order to make these big players, already big players, much bigger. I mean, I'm not anti-big player, but I do think that uh, there is an enormous imbalance in this. And we, as a startup, we always have to think about how we get the budgets from you. That's why, you know, it's 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 a good question now. And when we have the meetings, we say, oh, well, listen, you're investing 100,000 euros in advertising on Google. Now, just take 50,000 euros of that, and we build you a really good Um, communication network you can upsell and within five years you will earn a million. How do you see that? I mean, how, how do you invest? I mean, how, how do you get the reach you have? Obviously, we try, I mean, on the one hand, we've got all sorts of advertising measures and Google is one of the issues, certainly, but we also, if you want to get uh, a certain reach, we do our own little trailers, which we have on Facebook. We're using Facebook quite a bit now. Obviously, the the sort of ratio um, premium online has, has changed a bit, but we always have some money. That's really what matters. We always try to have money for innovation and new technology. We have such money available. That is really important. And when we're talking about all this software which we now have and which we invested in, when we had to uh, put money on the table to make sure the company could develop. But here too, I mean, startups and that's the, the investment environment is so dangerous if, if you can't generate uh, enough uh, turnover, if you're not fast enough, if your clients are, are too slow. And that's one of the problems with, with destinations. Travel startups have a problem. Gerald, it is a problem. Obviously, we as a sort of academic institution, publicly funded, we, we always try to do such pilots, um, how to take various routes uh, or suspend various routes in order to get things done faster. And we see that the first mover has sort of eaten up the market like Facebook. Not even Google can manage to set up a network such as Facebook has. So the first mover here in, in this particular context would be Google and you can't get in. Now, we're trying to do this at a smaller level, because sometimes that's easier if you can start small and have a sort of proper framework for that. But we're only starting thinking about this. And once you get to the federal ministry level, the national level, that is, it takes you five years to get things off the ground. So we're trying to do things at the local level, as I said. We try to get start startups on board as well, saying, why don't you come on these note platforms so you can tell, tell others that uh, it works. And we get to Uh, hit, hit the bit of a limit there because start to say no, no, no. Um, for us to join you, you've got to show us something. So that is a, a twofold problem. We'd love to work better with startups, but um, there are some obstacles there as well. I think we can help you um, link up a bit more. That wouldn't be a problem. The question of funding, uh, especially in the rural area, you can find many uh, different partners when you're looking in the municipal environment, as the question from Erfurt asked, that may be different. Maybe there you have to get partners from across other industries where you're saying, okay, I'll work with the transport authority or what have you, but then you get don't get your 200,000 euros. Then you have a level of complexity in your project where you have to allow for pretty large sums. And we often read people say, let's build a platform. And then you, you plan for uh, 20,000 euros and you've got an external consultant. And there is a high level of frustration coming out of it for the city, the people. And, and altogether, it's a pretty negative view for digitization. And you know that from the word go. What would be your presentation, uh, suggestion then? Well, I think digitization can only be helpful if people have come together in analog form beforehand or think about what's the plus, what's the minus, who can work with who else to make progress somewhere here. If not, we can try to do a, another sort of digitization development which works without the people who would ever use the, the services. Then we are back to the beginning. So connection, connection, connectivity, data, data, right? And have I forgotten something? And we still have time for one question, if there is one. Yes, Martin Schober, tourism consultant. Google trips in uh, the urban setting. That already is pretty much state of the art and fulfills all the requirements you've outlined. And probably that's also going to get uh, rolled out to the rural um, areas. Wouldn't it be simpler for a destination to think into uh, how to use that instead of use resources to get other systems like guys in that case off the ground? Excellent. That's it. Yeah, well, you can do that, only then I don't need staff, and then I no longer have any justification to work as a DMO, full stop. If I'm not sufficiently creative to develop products, to get the branding up, and uh, 
to use the data I have. Like in, in our area of the Black Forest, we've got millions of data. We know exactly how the visitor flows work. We have the apps and so on. If I lack all that information, I'm asking myself, what's the justification for existing? Then I can go and retire. That's it. I think you'll have to really uh, make it mandatory for your um, local authority and say, you know, to everybody that digitization is, is very much a, a public service and you need to tackle that. But the also the ultimate question is the guests decide what they use. So you've got to be really good and good now because every single day you lose gives more room to the others. It's now that you've got to put your foot down. We all need to understand that. Well, we're coming to the end really now. And I think this whole debate about digital um, development, future of DMO, visitor flow direction and so on, that was quite an interesting feel. And now you could only say either you leave it to the big players or you work very hard and get it off the ground yourself. I mean, obviously, a small round from the panel. What do you think is the most important thing for the smart destination of the future? What's the very first thing we need to tackle now? As a representative of Fraunhof, I can tell you we have a new government and they've got this word home, home country, home whatever. Um, and what else is home if not your local area? So please force your own local authorities to provide money for all sorts of projects. So many things come together, money, expertise, and the courage to get and do it. I think courage, that's it. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing we need to start with. My issue is always to create something which is desirability, desirability in the market, so that the guest actually wants to visit a, a destination because he, he or she likes it. Wonderful. Thanks to all the panelists. I hope you've enjoyed that exciting debate for all of us. I, I thought it was fun. Perhaps we'll meet again next year. Thank you.